Welcome to the Adam Savage Project. I'm Adam Savage. I'm Norm. I'm Greg and Munson. Greg Munson! Hey! Dude, how's it going? It has, been, it has been too long since we've chatted, my old friend. How are you? Nice to see you. I've been good. I've been good. A little cooped up, but I've been fine. How, how are you guys? We are holding up. We are, yeah. you know, I'm still recovering from the Thanksgiving at Eating Fest. Yes. Me too. Well, we I did it smart though. We had, we got sort of a delivered Thanksgiving meal, and they gave you exact right por- proportions. And I'm uh-huh. like, why isn't it? I couldn't go back for seconds. And like, what? oh, thank God, I can't go back for seconds because no, that's... <laughs> I just had two pieces of meat and a little potato. I'm like, I'm done. I don't feel disgusting. You know, I, I don't feel horrible. Ooh, so, we did the same thing, but we got like four servings worth, yeah. so we could go back and we're gonna make some sandwiches tonight. I did want Leftovers. more stuffing. I was kind of like, no, there's not enough stuffing. But Greg, yeah, you are. This is an exciting day for you. Yes, because BattleBots airs tonight on Discovery. Yes, it's awesome. BattleBots on Thursday night, uh, December third, if whatever day we're happening, you know, this winds up on the internet. But yes, it's happening. It's awesome, and we can't wait. And it was such a challenge to get this season off the uh, off the bat. So we're super excited add- that we got to pull it off before the end of the year. Okay, Can we so, pick your brain about some of that? I mean, I, I yeah. remember hearing and reading that you guys were supposed to start like right at the beginning of when all this lockdown was happening. And tell us about the journey to getting to actually film it. I'm, I'd also love to hear for perspective what the shoot was like last year versus this year. So oh, yeah, man. tell yeah. us. Tell us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Working with robots made it really easy, didn't it? Oh, well, the robots are, well, no, none of it's easy. Um <laughs> So, you know, like normal, we shoot the show in spring break. Some, whenever that spring break window is for the schools, because we sell tickets to the live event and shoot during the live event. Um, and of course, March, you know, is like, we're not going to be able to do this. We're selling tickets. People are making plane tickets. Bot builders have their robots. And literally on the day that the robot, well, it was 24 hours before the robots were going to ship to Long Beach, shut down. And so we're shut down. And we're like glad we're shut down because no one wants to do an event right. in this climate. It's not it's not smart. We were going to shut it down anyway, but the health department shut it down. Um, and we're like, oh, that's it. What are we going to do? So for that was in April or early, that was in March. And then f- all the way up through September, like what is that, six months or something, we're on Zoom calls every Tuesday doing these contingency meetings with the executive producers thinking, all right, how... What are we going to do? And we're studying the virus science and we're studying the best practices and the best practices are evolving over the course of these months. And we're looking at what other production companies are going to do for their shows. And then some of them will start to do their shows and certain things are working great and some things are not working great. So we learned from that. But we finally got the window in sort of September that we could do it in either the late September or October. We wanted to give the bot builders enough time to restart because a lot of their mm-hmm. schools and maker spaces and offices were shut down. They couldn't even get to their bots. Like they're about right. ready to ship. And then the company shuts down where the bot was in sort of like the machine shop part of the company. Right. And they're like, no, you can't come, come, can't come to work. So we had to give some time for that. But anyway, we, we pulled it off in um, October and I'm happy to say we shot uh, like 40 hours of TV wow. with probably... I don't know, 500 people on set. Oh my and God. And nobody got COVID. Oh. And two weeks <laughs> after we checked in with everybody, nobody got COVID. So, I'm, I mean, there's some luck there, but we were, I mean, Chris Cowan, who's our head EP, really was studying the science of the virus. And, and we have a fantastic uh, executive in charge of production, Troy, and him and his team. And I helped him with these these protocols for the for the builders and for the whole crew. Yeah. Um, you know, and it comes down to basic stuff, you know, keep people distant, test everybody, test them before they get there, test them the second they get there, keep testing them while they're there and wear a mask. Um, but the the you know, and then you know, just clean everything, disinfect UV lights, extra electrostatic sprayers mm-hmm. all the time. Um, but the one cool thing that probably a lot of people have never heard about or hear less about um, that we used hugely to our benefit was we were lucky enough to have this ginormous building in Long Beach where they build airplanes. 
It's this old mm, building right. where they, I mean, you could fit probably seven air, 747s in this thing. It's so huge. I mean, my, my, uh, count, you know, step counter on my phone was like 20,000 steps each day. It was just like, <laughs> my feet still hurt. Um, <laughs> so huge building that has fan after fan after fan, an array of fans on the ceilings to, as long as you open the elephant doors, we yeah. are sucking air through that thing constantly. And it was, they were old, we had to refurbish them, but we got a massive air exchange system to work. And then we built one for the arena. So when you watch the show and you see the builders, some of them will not have masks on. It's because there's this volume of air shooting up wow. and out. So if anything gets aerosolized, and of course we've already tested, they've worn masked, masks in the pit. Um, yeah. You know, they've been socially distanced, so they're not sick. But if, if there was that aerosolized stuff or the coughing or the droplets would blast up oh, and out and get out of the building. And, and otherwise it would be killed, you know, be killed by our Lysol sprays and wipes and all that kind of stuff. I, I'm wrapping my head around this. It's so gobsmacking. But just to be clear, last year you made 20 hours of content. Am I right? You're making twice as much this year? Yeah, I'm just trying to think. So we did 20 episodes. They were two hours. 24? Yeah, yeah, we did 40 hours of TV. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. And last season, That's... I forget what we did. I think we were, we're two. No, we did. We did about we did a little bit less, but. Anyway, the difference you asked Adam about last year and this year, obviously, is the audience. So we right. had no audience this season. And we actually constructed these, we call them opera boxes, right? So the builders who are not on deck, who are on, who are on deck to fight, they right. usually, in a non-COVID world, they sit there backstage waiting, hey, when's my fight? You know, we have a monitor for them. We have some shitty fold-up chairs. They sit there <laughs> and they're just waiting. So now we said, well, we're going to put you in these opera boxes. Each yeah. team is a pod. They're, they live together, you know, they, yep. you know, so they can be unmasked. And we have the air exchange going up through them. And the pods are, we shot it with a long lens, so they seem close, but mm. they're way far apart. Um, and so that's the audience. Those are the reactors to what happens in the box. So someone gets smashed, you'll, you'll cut to gigabyte up in the opera box. We're like, and it works. You don't even, you barely know the, the, the real live audience who would buy tickets and kids from all over the country and the world are not there. It's, it worked really effectively. However, for me and, and the crew being in the audience and not having that roar of, the, of yeah. all those people behind you and seeing all the little kids come in with their signs that they made at home, how I love Tombstone or Bite Force or whatever it is. You know, when that happens every year, I get a little teary because, you know, we sure. made this thing and we thought eh, it's a show. But like the real payoff is when all those kids come in and do and have their shirts and they're digging it and they're loving it. And some of those kids will be engineers when they're older because of the show, which is great. Um, that didn't happen. So that's that. You'll never see that on TV. The TV show actually is probably some of the best fights we've ever had. It's amazing. But as I'm sitting there and no, no one is, there's no energy behind me. Yeah. No yeah. Doing. That's the thing. Yeah. Um, I'm curious um, because this is really fascinatingly instructive. You guys had 500 people in a building for what was the length of production? Three weeks, two weeks, two weeks. Oh my crazy. God. It's crazy. Poor bastards. Yes. Uh, Keep on rolling those weeks, cameras. 40 <laughs> hours of television, 500 people and no, no infections. No, I mean, it was great. I mean, you know, we were tested. I mean, the talent was probably tested every single day. We were tested every other day. You just have is like, there any, we had is a there whole lab to there? ourselves. I mean, it sounds like you guys were doing absolutely everything that you could. But like, let's say you're talking to a small business owner who says, oh my God, tell me the secret. Is there, is there Were there key things you did that you didn't expect that really helped? I think the air exchange system was was vital. Yeah. I think that was and uh, testing. You got to have that. You got to have testing there all the time. You got to keep doing it. I mean, a, a document from IATSE, the union, the stage end union came out and it had charts showing that if you test at the beginning and the end, you'll have this percentage of probability for an infection. Oh. If you test, you know, every single day, the probability goes way down. And so wow. we we got it as tight as we could based on the lab that we hired to do it. Plus, and all, all sets have this now. You, ha you have to hire a, a compliance team. Right. So they're the COVID right. police. They sit there. They have little jackets on. Oh, put your mask on. Oh, you guys are too close. <laughs> You're not in the pod. You're not in the same pod. Get, get away. Wash your hands. You know, bullhorns. Hand washing time. You know, so we did all that. Oh tell, tell, us, 
Tell us about over the summer, the uh, the BattleBots community, the the builders. I'm sure they're all, and you guys included, were kind of you know waiting with bated breath to see if it would happen. But what were they doing? What was that the, that you know the the message boards like? Because they all talk to each other, right? Yeah. Well, it was this constant ping pong of like, we're gonna do the show in June. No, we can't <laughs> do the show in June. We're gonna do the show in July. No, we can't. And it was just, they were getting really frustrated. Um, they would call me ne- Mr. Next Week. Because I'm the guy who talks to the bot builders and gets right. them fired up and, and recruits them and gets them into the show. Um, and they people actually printed T-shirts that said, next week, next week, next week, next week. <laughs> they were so frustrated <laughs> with you know me going, I think we'll get to do it next week. We'll find out next or, week. Or <laughs> any know? using that time for actual like more building? Or well, just so that's the good news wants- is uh, there were people, like I said before, who were locked out of their makerspaces or whatever and couldn't do anything. So we wanted to give them that buffer between September and October to, to get ready. But there was a whole nother batch of people, probably half, maybe you know, a third, maybe a little more, somewhere between that, who had their bots right there in their garages. And this is why the season is so amazing is because they were ready in April, but then they had all the way till October to get extra ready, which meant spare robots, spare part. Let me rethink that weapon a little better. Let me actually make four of those weapons and bring them all because I know (laughs) the first one's going to get wrecked and I'll have to turn it around really quick. So in terms of production, smooth sailing and bots being ready, which is always an issue, uh, it was a lot better this time. And the fights were um, consequently just more delicious and more gourmet damage because the bot builders had all that time to to get re- that extra time to get ready. What a what an amazing what an amazing confluence of things to conspire because that extra time I mean what def- so many builders are eliminated because of their own mistakes. It's why I always loved that original double elimination in Long Beach. Yeah, no, uh-huh. like you, you know what happens typically is people there'll be the veterans who have their bots ready and they're ready yep. to go and the full you know they roll up like a NASCAR team and they got three chassis in the top you know, yeah. roll up the sleeves, but then all manner of newbies and sort of, you know, maybe year two into it, people like they're building, they're still building their bot when they get there. I mean, Adam yeah. probably remembers from the, from the early comedy central days and even the robot wars days, people just put their, their unfinished bot on the table. Like I'm still working. Oh, I got a fight tomorrow. Oh, I'll be ready. You know, five, they call me next week. I call them five minutes because five minutes means five hours. Right. Right. I mean, and the thing is, is that like you'd have people show up and they lift their bot and because they tilted it at 30 degrees, some piece of metal hit a battery and the thing catches on fire before anything ever happens. It's the, it's the wire management. Please, <laughs> please. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I've had, we've all had these, these experiences where you have to take apart a, the, your car for some reason, right? And you like, whatever you're doing and you just see how nicely those wires and they butt into these little connectors and like, Oh, that's not, I, the robot should be like that. And like, maybe, (laughs) maybe duck does that. Right. Yeah. You know, Hal Rucker does that, but builders, if you're watching this wire management, is (laughs) the amount of, that's what screws you. The amount of momentum that can happen on a wiring harness that isn't mounted to a wall. No bang over one stupid little connection gone. Your robot's dead. I remember one in the early, early days. I can't remember who it was, but I think it was Robot Wars, or it might have been the first Long Beach one, BattleBots, um, where somebody's spike literally hit the impossible battery short in an otherwise completely armored robot, and they managed to like thread the needle by accident and kill their opponent. Yeah. That sounds like a pressure drop or like or whatever the, the inertia lab guys had. They had those punt those spiky punchers back in that day. Yeah. And yeah. Oh my no, god. No, like one little thing. And and what of course for the TV show, we want the death to be dramatic. And sometimes you don't you don't get it. It's one little bump and then smoke starts petering mm-hmm. out the the wheel wells. <laughs> and it's like he just knocked that little thing off and the, the bot's dead. One of the other things, the one of the other virtuous cycles that BattleBots has engendered. And I don't know if it gets enough credit for this, is in the economy of scale for robot builders across the planet. Uh, I mean, and I know that first robotics is is part of this equation, um, but 
the amount, like the things that are available to a robot builder now would would have seemed like a ridiculous fantasy to me in 2000 and in, in, in 1995. Right, exactly. So case in point, La Machine, our robot, two giant batteries from a car, boom, boom. Cause we want to go to 48 volts. Right. <laughs> and it's like, and it's like, that's your weight. Your weight is gone. The rest you can just like, yeah. it's over. Um, which is why La Machine was a stupid wedge. Cause it just had a stupid wedge of two giant batteries. Nowadays, the, the, you know, those are two little lipo packages. Right. And you yeah. add much more, much more and you get these tremendous amounts of power. So even just the battery updates alone, accounts for so much innovation and so much more destructive power in the bots that it's amazing. But then you got advances in speed controllers, you've got remote controls now that can, you know, give you real-time diagnostics. So, you know, the thing's overheating. So people are getting really smart, shut the weapon down. Okay. It's cool. Shut it, turn it back on. You know, Chris and Kenny think the weapon's dead. Ah, they're just shutting it down because it's, it's overheating. Now they turn it back on it right. two minutes into the fight. A lot of good um, stuff happening and it ultimately equals much better fights. Absolutely. I'm curious about young competitors. Uh, are, tell me about some of the uh, some of the first timers in this season that uh, you're looking forward for people to see their work. Yeah. So we've got Tyler, um, who's a kid. I think he's 11 years old. He's the youngest team captain. We've had lots of little kids who drive, but yeah. you know, dad or, or the or the family or the you know the group of older people build a bot. But yeah. Uh, Tyler's the full blown team captain. I mean, he's working on the bot. He's been shepherded by Ray Billings from Tombstone, who's the ultimate ultimate. But the guy is super smart. He's been to Robo Games, you know, which happens happened in San Francisco, and he scares the bejeebus out of the adult competitors because they know him from Robo Games, where that kid can drive and he's strategic. He's a Menza. He's super smart, um, and he'll he'll kick their ass. And so when people are like, oh, I got to fight, I got to fight Perfect Phoenix. Oh, man, I don't want to fight because like they know he'll be so good. So it's great to have Tyler on the show. Um, he almost did make it. You know, a lot of teams almost didn't make it because of the COVID thing. But we're just like, we're going to do this. We're going to do that. We published a 30 page booklet, sent it to all the builders. They sent out back a jillion questions. We updated it, updated it. And finally, we got 62 robots to come, including Tyler and um, wow. 62. He, yeah. Oh my God. But he's fantastic. He, he took an old robot from our champion, Paul Vintimiglia that he used back when he was a high school kid. Um, and I don't think Tyler's even in high school yet. He's still in grade school. Um, and he's upgraded it with the help of Ray. And it follows that old helicopter design that did so well back in the comedy central days with hazard. And mm -hmm. um <clears throat> he's a force to be reckoned with and he's super smart and super articulate and great to do in a post match interview with. He's awesome. Hey guys, Adam here to let you know that today's podcast is brought to you by my friends at American giant. And just to be clear, they're my friends because I fell in love with their product a few years ago and talked about it as one of my favorite things at the end of one of the years on tested. And they reached out and sent our crew some more of their incredible clothing. They truly make the greatest hoodie you have ever put on. I literally live for weeks in that thing. Don't worry, I wash it. And right now, you can get 15% off your first order when you use promo code ADAMS at American-Giant.com. That's 15% off when you use code ADAMS, A-D-A-M-S, at American-Giant.com. Amazing. Are there any um, brand new design ideas that, uh, that you're excited for people to see? Yes. So forever we have been wanting to do, you know, we've had, we've sort of dabbled in like, oh, we'll give you a weight bonus if you're a walker. And probably people remember Mechadon, you know, Mark Satrakians, yeah. and he was 450 pounds. Yeah. But in the new reboot of the show, we've always kept a 250, one weight class, no four weight classes anymore, 250, single arc to a champion, good story, great show, done. Yeah, yeah but... We still want to do those walkers. So we had this big old meeting in Los Angeles. Mark Satraki was there. Scott LaValle, who's a super smart Boston yep. robot, you know, uh, Boston yep. Dynamics and Disney guy. <laughs> um, and a bunch of people from Applied Invention, which is the old Applied Minds. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. And we're, okay, we want to do is a walking Applied clash. Invention, is that Danny or Bran? I think it's Dan. I'm going to get it wrong, but I think it's Danny. <laughs> <laughs> they did split up. And, yeah. I always get it mixed up in my head. Anyway. Yeah. Anyway. Um, so we so we decided 500 pound, 
And we don't, we're not going to put a whole list of rules about what a walker is. You tell us what your walker is. We'll vet it. And we'll say if you deserve the 500 pound. And we don't even call it walkers. We call it, I forget what we say exactly in the rules, but unique forms of mobility. <laughs> so someone, you know, Rex sent in, I'm going to do the gyroscope thing where I walk all over the place. We said, no, you don't deserve 500 pounds for that. <laughs> but Zoe and Yasha, so if you remember Yasha did the yeah. judge in the old show, and Zoe is this amazing designer who also works at Applied uh, Invention. I love Zoe. She's great. She says, I'm upgrading Chomp um, to make it a pneumatic walker. Six-legged pneumatic walker wow. with a turret that can be independent, right, of the walking. So you can walk this way, but point the turret backwards. Um, lots of AI like she always likes to do. And a giant freaking hammer that Yasha is so known for. And that robot is super exciting. I mean, I, I, I you know, I don't want to oversell it because, you know, it's a walking robot. The whole reason why yeah. you get 500 pounds is because a walker will typically be slower mm -hmm. than a wheel bot. So people have to be ready for that. But it's 500 pounds and the mechanisms are so beautiful. They have, I mean, that's what a walker should be. They have little feet, they have little ankles, they have little knees, they have little hips. Everything swings and, and inverse kinematics together. And it's beautiful. And and the hammer is, you know, like the judge. Oh, it's man. crazy. So I'm super excited about that robot. And I think I think fans will dig and I hope people enjoy watching New Chomp fight. Dude. What was the pit like? Uh, you know, in the years we've we've visited, you know, the, the benches and the big lights, and you know, someone's filming interviews there. But you know, under the new production circumstances and and teams and distancing, what was it like? It's ne it's never it's it's going to be the toughest thing ever because the pit was so great. The pit was it better than ever. Normally, we shove the builders as close as we can. And we're fighting, like I'm saying, no, you got to get them 10 feet apart. But if we, we can't fit that over there, so you got to, can we go seven feet apart? Eh, no, come on. And they're squeezed in like sardines and they're butting into each other on, under normal circumstances. But with COVID, 20 feet apart, three pit wow. tables, not one, in a U shape so you can define your space and no one can get into it. Bike <clears throat> rail so no one can mess with you. Um, and you know, 20 feet this way is your partner, your neighbor over there. And 20 feet is your neighbor over there instead of like eight feet. Um, so, and then food brought to you, right? <laughs> Supplies brought to you. If you order something from McMaster car it is brought to you. Right. So the builders were really spoiled during this event, obviously for safety reasons. Um, and you know, they're, they're usually give me a laundry list of, of, of stuff. We gotta, gotta fix this for next time, Greg, we gotta do this. This time was like, I love that. That was so great. We had, oh, this is, you know. so it's going to be really hard because we don't get to have that building next season. It's, it's, they, they're going to sell it. So yeah. gotta find a place that's big and we can do it again, because I don't think we're, we're going to ever get, we're going to not be able to take that back. Well, I mean, you probably got much better coverage because they were separated too. You're able to tell much more individual stories, right? Yeah, you can get right up in there. I mean, obviously the camera's got to be way back and with booms and all that stuff. Um, but we had drones flying in the pit to get these overhead shots, um, mm. which was really great. But everyone's just more comfortable, more relaxed. People can go, like my favorite thing is builders will go to a thrift store and buy a couch for like 40 bucks and just yeah. shove it in the back of their thing. And then they'll use it to sleep and rest and hang out. They'll buy camping chairs. Now they have, <laughs> I mean, the Wyachis bought, like went to Bass Pro Shop and like bought every camping thing under the sun and had like a full blown, like, you know, giant open air tent with a refrigerator and their own wow. TV. And it's just like, it was great. Good luck, good luck us trying to find that for next season. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that is really thrilling. I, I I love the fact that it didn't necessarily inhibit the process. It made it better for the participants. It made it way better. People were super chill and relaxed and, and had plenty of room to fix and get ready. And people are bringing multiple chassis nowadays. So you can't give them just that little square footage that we used to because they're bringing three, they're rolling four robots deep, a lot of these teams. Yeah. Do you have a do you have a vision for a, a, a first robotics leg of BattleBots where you get high schools interested in following best practices to 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 feed the pipeline? Yeah. No. We so back in the after right at the tail end of Comedy Central, we started this thing called BattleBots IQ, and we did it in Miami because the the okay. woman who helped us do it, Nola Garcia, um, who was so passionate about STEM and et cetera, et cetera, and had inroads to a bunch of schools in in the Miami area. 
we did that for like 12 years and all of the top new young guns who are not so young anymore come from that program. So, mm -hmm. um, uh, Mark DeVitz, uh, yep. you know, Paul Ventimiglia, Andrea from Witch Doctor, you know, Ice Wave, Witch Doctor, Bite Force, yeah. uh, Hypershock. A lot of these kids came from the IQ program. Now we don't do it anymore, but Trey and I have always want to rekindle it. We just need to find the time and energy to do it. And there's always sort of, because you you got to have not only the farm league, but BattleBots is such a great sort of um, in, inspirational tool to get kids into STEM. And what's, you know, I love FIRST, I love VEX, but yeah. we, we've always said two things. That sort of seems to be for the kids who know they want to be engineers and have always been inclined towards engineering. And BattleBots is- It is a self-selected group. Yeah, yeah BattleBots is- for those kids too, but it's also maybe attracts the kids who never even had a clue that they wanted to be in engineering. They just think this sort of video game come to life is a lot of fun and they might get dragged into it by their engineering friends and suddenly yeah. they are into it now too. So that's cool. That that adds a different element to the, a little bit of diversity to what would normally yeah. be just that. Um, and then it's a different experience because first is fantastic, but it's like the Mars Rover, right? Yeah. You get your parts, you got your mission, you're going to go to Mars and you're going to do this, right? BattleBots yeah. is like Apollo 13. The spaceship <laughs> is broken. We're going to die. We need to fix it now or <laughs> it's over. So BattleBots is great because you learn tenacity and you, you learn to be resourceful on the fly yeah. right then and there or that's it. So great, great, it. great. Both are great tools for young engineers. And we, we've got to rekindle what we used to do, I think, for sure. I totally agree. I support that entirely. I think it's a, it's a, it's a I, I mean, obviously we all meet first robotics kids and, and Vex kids and this, it's really awesome how passionate and excited they are. And I think you're right. I think this, uh, a BattleBot school program does not bastardize either of those categories. It simply augments in the exact right way. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. When did it be a BattleBots junior or something like that? Yeah. 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 And from like a production standpoint, you know, every year to year, how are you thinking about the format and the best ways to showcase what people, the audience wants to see, but also serve the builder community? You know, how does BattleBot evolve in, in your mind? Yeah. So, you know, when we, when we did the show with Comedy Central, it was a single elimination. So back in Long Beach, we did double. But then since we got to TV, there's so many bots. The only way we could figure it out with four way classes was to go single. And that sucks. If you're building, you're spending six months to build a bot and you lose because of just like what Adam was saying, one little thing dribbled over here and hit a wire and you're dead, which I can fix. I can fix it in five minutes. Let me back in. Sorry, it's over. Yeah. So what's so great about the new season and we've evolved it each season of the reboot is that we give the bot builders like four fights. And if you get into the tournament and you keep going, you could have like in this current season, I think you have to fight eight fights to win the giant nut, which wow. is amazing. Wow. That's an amazing amount of fights. And it creates a whole nother host of problems. You have massive attrition issues and people now have to come in like a NASCAR team with four chassis and all kinds of extra parts and a full right. team of people who are not just friends going like, this is cool. We're doing robot. No, they're like <laughs> NASCAR rolling deep. They, each one has a job, you know? So, but that evolution is so much more fun for the bot builders. And at the end of the tournament, when everyone's broken and spent, we put up a giant board usually saying grudge matches and that thing fills up like that because people yeah. want to go again. They just yeah. keep, I want to keep fighting. I want to keep fighting. So we've, we've evolved the format to allow the builders to keep going and going and fight as much as they possibly can and really get their time and efforts worth that they put into the bots originally. So that's fantastic. That's a great evolution. And obviously we'll continue that. And I, I you know, I I know what you're what we were saying earlier about simple mistakes uh, eliminating people but the other thing that I've noticed over the years that the, the BattleBots has been going is an entire generation of robot builders and I'm not segregating by age just by the fact that they're building robots has gained so much institutional knowledge about building things that are hit proof damage proof that it strikes me that you might not even be that far from a, a, a 24 hours of lemons style <laughs> robot event in which like junkyard wars, people have to build the bots and then fight them all within the same competition. Now, that's a cool idea. Like exactly, right. Okay. That one's free. You got you like have 48 that. hours. Here's a bunch of parts, build it now. And then tomorrow we fight, you know, that, Dude. that'd be pretty cool. <laughs> right? That's a good offshoot. Yeah. 
I like it. Um, I, I, this is a, a personal question because I know he's probably going to listen to this. Your, your EP is, is my old friend Chris Cowan, who he has EP'd several shows with me. Um, now, Chris went and grew a COVID beard long before COVID. He got that giant beard. I'm curious, what did his beard do in COVID? Did it get even crazier or did it stay the same? No, it got, it got, it actually, it's amazing how he takes care of that thing because it got kind of crazy, you know, over the course of these Zoom meetings over the months, it would get a little crazier, but Chris is well-groomed. So you could see it then taper down and then go back a little crazy and then come back. It was the hair on top of here that was going nuts. He, this is great, <laughs> but this stuff was all over the place. It was like, you take his hat off. And blah, 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 blah. No, but Chris is great. He, we all actually, as the, as the Zoom meetings progressed, it, it was Chris, it was me. It was all like all the dudes in the production were growing these COVID beards. We look like <laughs> yeah. hockey players or something, you know? I, I tried. My wife asked me, she's like, go ahead and grow it all out. Let's see. And after about a week, I'm like, no, I look like, I feel like I'm homeless. I feel like I look like I'm homeless and I got to groom. Grooming is like one of the ways in which I normalize. So you got, you're like, if you're going to do this thing, you got to, you got to, you got to maintain it. Otherwise you go, it goes nuts. You've yeah. got a small, yeah. you know, animal on your face. Um, is there something we haven't covered that you're excited that people get to see in this new season? Um, what is it? I mean, the, oh, we have a new, we have a new arena. That's cool. Oh, it's really? not, it's not, you know, it's the ship of thesis, right? It keeps being, <laughs> you know, right. Yeah. <laughs> it's still part of what it was in, in nine, whatever, 1999, but now it's 2020. It's just, I don't know what's left. Right. Right. But, um, last season it became super apparent that the floor was winning fights stupidly uh -huh. like a robot would get stuck and you know cobalt was really beating the crap out of duck and duck's a great yeah. robot don't get me wrong but cobalt was beating him and then at like 30 seconds before the bell when cobalt would easily want to get stuck in this little rip up from the floor and can't get and duck wins and the fans wow. hate it and they go crazy yeah. and we hate it and so trey my partner uh, and cousin so that's it we're fixing this floor and we went from like you know a bunch of little plates of eighth inch steel to like a massive piece of half inch. Uh, welded the thing, made the whole gussets that holds it all together much stronger, you know, um, just reinforced everything on that floor. And, you know, no, no, there was no peeling this season. Everything is smooth sailing. We still, you know, the, the box is four foot modules that we yeah. put together. We still don't align them perfectly. We <laughs> still, and we tell the builders this, we still have little gaps because the sure. ground game gets stupid. It's yeah. like, oh, I'm going to have a wedge that's even <laughs> lower than your wedge. It's like, so no. It's like, you got to know there's going to be little teeny, you know, 16th, 8th and eighth an inch gaps. And you got to deal with it. And we even have, Trey has these things called whack-a-moles that pop out. Just yeah. for, just a little bit and they're rounded off, they're radius. But if your wedge is going, wham, he might hit a whack-a-mole and go, boom. Because he, oh. he doesn't want it. And we argue about this a lot because I don't really like the whack-a-moles. But in where, where he, I think he's absolutely right. Is like, if you're just going to like win by wedging, uh -uh. you got to like, you know, it's got to be a little more strategy than just box rushing. Right. Um, Greg, I'm, I'm uh, I, normally on the last few week, weeks of the podcast, I've been asking everybody about how they got through COVID, about where they found their inspiration. But it sounds like you had that already built into your year. We were just working the whole, I mean, it was a great distraction to just all the time be working and working, and working and, and creating ways and different ways we could pull off the show and then finally getting to do it. And then to have no infections is just such an incredible, wonderful feather to put in your cap. I remember our first meeting to talk about BattleBots in that train car in Potrero <laughs> Hill. That was your office for yes. a while, right? Yes. And so that's got to be now 22 years ago. Or Probably, something. yes. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just, it's been such a thrill. And I'm so excited about the new season, man. Congratulations. Thank you. Should I, I, we should talk about one last thing. Yeah. So, um, you know, unfortunately, Grant passed away, which was probably the hugest tragedy for our community in 2020. Yeah. Uh, totally. like, awful. So to honor Grant, we took our best, you know, we do, we have the giant nut but then we have three, sometimes four best of show awards, the most prestigious of which is the best design award. Yeah. So we changed that to the Grant Imahara uh, best design award. 
um, and, and the builders vote on it. So now we have sort of saying, you know, in the remembrance of Grant and his, his gratitude, his awesome engineering, his talent, his creativity, all the things that he would put into his, his robots and everything he did. Who do you think lives up to that inside of BattleBots? And we awarded it. I won't tell you who, who it is yet because that'll be hopefully revealed at the end of the season. If not, I'll definitely put it online. Um, mm. But we're but we're going to keep doing that from every year now on. So there'll be the Grant Imahara Best Design Award, which we're super yeah. proud of. And and thank you, Grant, for everything you did. That's, I had a real emotional reaction to hearing that. What a beautiful thing. That is really, what a grace, Greg. That's so lovely, man. Oh, well, it's good, good to see you, you. Good to and see good you guys. luck on the the premiere of the show. We'll be watching Thank this you. Thursday. It's right. Yep, on Discovery Thursday at eight. You know, so the satellite cable things are always funky. So check your guide because, like, on the West yeah, Coast, check your local like, listing. It could be on. It could be on at five. So just look. Check your guide. And am I correct? It would also then later show up on Discovery Go if that's still their OTT, or we don't know. Yeah, whatever OTC they're using, it's good. It'll show. It'll probably show up there. And oftentimes they make it available on, on the Amazons and the Hulus, but that's up oh, to great, them. Great, great. And they'll do what they do with that. Usually they do do that though. Well, Greg, when uh, when human beings are are shaking hands in person again and meeting, we'd love to have you over to the cave. Love it. Uh, and uh, and say howdy in person. But uh, for right now. Dude, good luck with the season, and I hope it kills. Thank you, guys. I appreciate you having me on, and, and thank you. Absolutely. Great.